you would please take a look at your worship card. Let me put a couple of things on your calendar. We had a good time, uh, me and the kids back there, and uh, Dr. Mark and Ms. Becky uh, working in the children's Sunday school. We had a new prize this week. Ready? Parents, you're going to love this one. Say a little pair of lips. <laughs> that makes a really obnoxious noise. Yeah. And uh, now they're going back to your houses. So, really looking forward to that. So, um, some things you'll see here in the worship card, of course, the Dwell app is available to you. Uh, Peacemakers is uh, an important ministry here in the Rocky Mount area. Of course, their headquarters is uh, closer to downtown here in Rocky Mount. Um, they do an incredible work ministering primarily to underprivileged children uh, near Center City Rocky Mount in doing uh, various educational initiatives, uh, helping those kids get through school and to thrive. Um, they run, in particular, a reading program in the summer, uh, an academic camp-type academy, and almost every year they take in a couple of hundred kids who are a grade or two behind their reading level and move them forward three or four reading grade levels during the summer. They just do an incredible amount of work. They do some housing renovation. They do uh, any number of things. It's an incredible ministry. Their annual banquet is at 7 p.m. this Thursday, October the 7th, at Inglewood Baptist Church. If you would be interested in attending that banquet, we have seven seats available at our table. It's free to you. The church has already purchased that table. Um, so it's uh, a, a free dinner there at Inglewood, plus the program that uh, Peacemakers is putting on. So if you're interested, just let me know. Um, and uh, there's a sign-up sheet on the table there in the foyer. We would love to have you. Again, there's plenty of seats for whoever would like to go. And that's Thursday night at 7 p.m. Our youth ministry meets next Sunday. Just want to make you aware of that, guys. So no youth tonight. CJ is, I think, in Florida. Is that where he's at? Um, however, we do have this morning two additional rising middle school students who weren't here last week, and we have something special for them. So, uh, James and Logan, if you could come up here and join me. Every time our middle school students come stand here right beside me, right? Stand in order of who's most handsome. Uh, there we go. All right. Uh, <laughs> Whenever our middle school students make their way from fifth grade into sixth grade and beyond and join our youth ministry, we want to make sure that we are living up to what we say we believe. And uh, one of the ways that we do that is we equip them with a uh, copy of the Word of uh, God. Originally, one of the ideas for this was uh, some of these kids had never owned a Bible before, and we all gave them the exact same copy of the Bible. That way, if they said, hey, I don't know where Second Chronicles you could tell them the page number, and they all had the same page numbers. <laughs> but it's also because we believe that there's an incredible thing that happens when the believer encounters the Word of God, that as it says in Jeremiah 23 and Isaiah 55, that it's like fire, like hammer hitting rock. It will not return void. It will do the thing that I have sent it to do. And of course, here in this month, uh, maybe more than the other months of the year, we think of Martin Luther, whose incredible ministry was founded on this idea that everything that he accomplished was done by the Word and by the Word alone. So, James, Harris, this is your youth ministry Bible. Logan, this is your youth ministry Bible. It is yours. It is yours to keep. And we tell you the exact same thing that we tell everyone else who gets this, which is if you will take care of that book, that book will take care of you. We are praying for you. You are not alone. There's a group of people in this room who are concerned about what it looks like for you to grow day by day into following Jesus Christ. So I'm going to pray for you right now, all right? And then uh, we're going to express how grateful we are for both of you, and uh, we'll let you sit back down, all right? Let's pray. Father, these are young men who are on the precipice of learning in a whole new and unprecedented way for them what it means to serve the bride of Christ, the church, and to glorify you and to make much of you in the way that they learn at school and as they move into the next stages of their lives. Father, I pray for both of them, that you would help them to walk in holiness, that they would be concerned with your glory, 
that they would be selfless, loving stewards of the gospel, and they would take it the entire world over. Strengthen them to that end, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good job, guys. You can have a seat. <laughs> you stand up here any longer and you have to preach. So, um, Something that is not in your bulletin, but I just keep forgetting to print off the uh, deal. Sunday, October the 17th, which is two weeks from today, we are going to go to Dean's Pumpkin Farm, if anybody is interested. Tickets are $5. We'll go on Sunday after church. Um, We'll have a sign-up sheet. You can find it online. We'll put it online. We'll put a paper copy out next week. If you decide the day of that you'd like to join us, go to Dean's Pumpkin Farm, which I think is just outside Wilson. Uh, we'll go uh, out there together again. Uh, tickets will be five dollars for our church family. I'd love just to have a rough head count so that when we get there, that'll be a great opportunity for us just to spend some time together and. Um, if you're curious about why pumpkins are so popular, I think Duncan's running a survey on this on Facebook. Americans love some pumpkins, man, so uh, we'll, we'll enjoy that time together. That'll be Sunday, October the 17th after church. Uh, moms and dads, parents, talk about that with your kids, and uh, uh, we'll see you then. Uh, Psalm 84. If you want to turn there, you can, but our call to worship this morning comes from the very beginning of Psalm 84. Credited to the sons of Korah, it starts in this way in verse 1. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. At your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Let's pray. Father, this morning there are those of us here gathered to sing your praise, to make much of you. I pray that you would lend us the strength necessary to do that and the focus. Father, I pray for those who cannot join us in person, those who are at home, those who are recuperating and recovering. Um, we pray for not only those who are battling cancer, but we think specifically this morning of um, Sharon Winstead, Don's wife, who is uh, in the uh, COVID wing at Nash Hospital. We pray that you would allow the doctors to do good work, wise work, as they get her oxygen numbers back up. We pray for Don and the family there. We pray for so many who are hurting, so many who are tired, so many who are weak, to acknowledge that the strength that we need to march forward in the faith comes from you. And for that strength, we appeal this morning in worship in the word, in Jesus' name, amen.
So let's continue in the Psalms. We'll be singing this morning from Psalm 131, which says, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. Please stand with us and sing. Okay, well, this, am I uh, missing my cue? Okay, I'm just looking at that slide and thinking, oh no, I walked up at the wrong time. <laughs> All right, so this morning, as we get into the Old Testament books of the Bible that we've been working through, several weeks for lately, we've been the major prophets, they're called major because they're longer, and now we're going to begin looking at some of the minor prophets. They're called minor, not because they're less important, but because they're shorter. And I think my position of microphone makes a huge difference. I hope that helps. Okay. So the thing about the minor prophets, there's 12 of them. Um, the Jews uh, sometimes combined them all into one scroll. Sometimes it was called the Book of the Twelve for the Old Testament readers of the Bible. And in our New, uh, or not in our New Testament, but in our New Covenant, Days, as we have the New Testament and the Old, these are books that are often sort of neglected because they're short, because they refer to very specific times in the nation of Israel. All of these prophets were responding to problems that the people in Israel had, to problems with sin. God asked them to do many different things. And the first prophet that we have for today um, is the book of Hosea. And so you see, of course, this is the book of Hosea because there's a garden hose in the picture. All right. So these books are harder to remember because you spend less time reading them. So we get really quirky pictures. All right. So Hosea, the theme of the book of Hosea is the word harlot. Okay. And this is a, also a book we just don't spend time in because it's difficult. Okay. So Hosea was an Old Testament prophet and God used him to convey a shocking story. Sometimes the prophets in the Old Testament spent most of their ministry speaking, telling the people of Israel how they had sinned and how God was calling them to repentance. Hosea, on the other hand, was given a story to live, and his story is the message itself. 
So you see, Hosea was told by God, I want you to go and marry this woman named Gomer. And Gomer left him. And Hosea knew that that was going to happen because God had told him that that would be the case. And so God used Hosea's story as a picture of how the nation had abandoned God. And you see, because, even though God's people forsook him, God pursued them in love. And so even though Gomer left Hosea, in the book, Hosea pursues her anyway, eventually buying her out of a slave market back to be his wife again as a picture of the unfailing love that God has for his people. So when you see this garden hose, remember Hosea and the story of his wife who became a harlot. Now we have another equally uh, challenging book, the book of Joel. And you will always remember this is the book of Joel because you see this huge jello, right? Obviously. All right, and what you see in the background is, as is, of course, perfectly natural, you have two locusts eating the jello because that's what locusts do. No, it isn't. But you see, locusts, we, we don't really have those in America per se. They're like an unusual kind of grasshopper. They show up periodically. Uh, you know, they'll not be around for many, many years. And then when they show up, they eat everything green in sight. And the book of Joel was written after a calamity, after a actual storm of locusts had come through the nation, eaten everything green, destroyed the harvest, which is a big, big deal because they don't get their food at grocery stores in these days. They grow it. And if everything that is growing has been eaten not by you, but by the bugs, what are you going to eat next year? So this is a big deal. And Joel used the locust storm as a warning that an army from the north would attack Judah, bringing devastation. And the um, book of Joel was written to call God's people to repentance, which is the only hope of escape. Now, in our Sunday school this morning, our children have been continuing in the book of Revelation. And in, that, in the uh, passages that we looked at today, we had Revelation 2 through 4, where you have three, seven, uh, I'm just going a million directions here, where Jesus appears to John and sends messages for him to send to seven churches. If I could have the next slide here. The, the main message of these letters is that Jesus told churches to not give up. And so John opens this book of Revelation with these messages from Jesus to seven churches. And these are real churches and real places. The churches were in Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And I, you, and I don't think any of you have been to those places, but those are real cities. In what we now call the country of Turkey, which is in this region you see on the map behind me called Asia Minor. And you can, uh, depending on how close to the front of the room you are, you may be able to read the names of the cities on the map. These were real places. There were real churches there with real people. And each of these churches had different needs. And so John writes different messages to them. Some of them needed encouragement. Some of them needed rebuke. Some of them needed to continue in what they were doing. And through the church, Jesus helps believers work together to do God's plan. All right, so the whole book of Revelation is moving towards a big point, and that is our big picture question that we've been working on since last week. Uh, if I could have the next slide, let's say the answer together. What is the hope of the church? The church looks forward to Jesus' return when he will make all things new. All right, and then let's have our memory verse. This is coming from the book of Revelation. Let's say this together. Revelation eleven fifteen. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. All right.
So as, as Paul introduces the armor in Ephesians chapter 6, he tells us first, be strong in the Lord. This begins with our great God occupying our hearts, owning us, and reigning supreme. It's only then that we can conquer every rebel power. So sing now with us about this, O great God. Please stand. of Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, Ephesians chapter 6 may be the most familiar passage to believers from the book of Ephesians. So why don't you go ahead and turn there to Ephesians chapter 6. And we'll take a look, starting in verse 10, our objective this week We'll break the rest of chapter 6 down into two parts. Is only verses 10, 11, and 12. So before we move on to our series on fellowship and thinking corporately about who we are together in the body of Christ as we work together to spread the gospel, we're going to spend the next two weeks in what is maybe the, uh, the most memorable part of the book of Ephesians this week, verses 10 through 12. Um, it's important here at the outset that we understand what it is that we're reading. Uh, Laura and I were watching a movie the other night, and it wasn't a particularly good movie. Um, but it was interesting for one fact that it was set in England in the 1930s. And in 1936-37, the people in this small town outside of London were all asking the same question, do you think that war is coming? Do you think that Hitler, then the Chancellor of Germany, might be able to be assuaged? Do you think that the schemes of Neville Chamberlain will work in keeping him at bay? Do you think 
that we will be able to escape the same fate that surely seems like it will befall Poland and other countries in the very near future. And eventually war comes. That whole movie was caught up in the tension of what might be. And there are an awful lot of believers who look at passages just like this one in Ephesians chapter 6, thinking about spiritual warfare in the exact same way that those folks were in the mid to late 30s there in England of what might be maybe fearful, maybe unsure, but all anticipating what they perceive is coming in the future, approaching this passage in an anticipatory sense. And before we go any further, it's important that you understand that when Paul writes to the Ephesians and then down through the ages to us, war is not coming. War is already here. It's not over the horizon. It's not standing in opposition to tomorrow. It's not been set for some future date. We are, in this church and every other on the globe, today in the middle of a great spiritual war. It's happening now. The battles are being fought now. Our response must be held now. And so when we engage this passage, just these first few verses, if we move over the next few minutes together, we must remember that what we are being warned against and equipped with is not potential. It is reality. It is here. It is present. It is now. So Paul writes, starting in verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 6, finally, concluding the great story of the book, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Father, I pray that you would guide us over the next few minutes through this passage. I pray that you would help us to see what it is that you have revealed about your unparalleled power, that you would help us to have nothing but the total confidence that comes from seeing through your word, how you have equipped the saints to respond in the days of darkness. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We're going to ask three questions, and really only three this morning. We're going to observe, what is our current state? That is our lack of strength. Secondly, who is God who gives us strength? And finally, what do we need strength for? So making a couple of very simple observations about the first few verses that we might see here, he says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. The need is real. We are at war. The enemy is real, violent, and active, and we have to awaken our souls to the truth of what's going on around us. You might, in a spiritual sense, feel the shells going off above your head, deafening and completely disorienting, the concussive shock taking your breath away and reminding you pointedly and painfully that we are in a war. And the very first thing that has to emerge in the hearts and minds of every believer is this. You ready? You will need strength for what is happening in this war. And you cannot make that strength. It doesn't come from you. One of the clearest statements of anthropology in the entire New Testament is that men and women are completely unable to defend themselves against the enemy apart from the power of the Lord. We are weak, fragile, incoherent in battle, 
Everything that we need is non-native to us. Our little internal combustion engines can't fire apart from the fuel that only God can provide. All our strength, all our power, all our stalwart moments are apart from us. This is a shocking message to most people who have grown up in a disney vibe world where you've heard this message over and over again. You ready? Because I know that you know it. There's a problem, some dilemma going on in your life, some decision that has to be made, some great calamity with which we wrestle, and the advice that comes from whatever parental or wise-like figure runs something like this. Well, you just need to look inside of you. All of your problems have their solutions internal in your own heart, in your own soul, in your own mind, in your own wisdom, in your own strength. You have what it takes. You know what to do and you have the strength to do it. Except we find repeatedly in Scripture that all of our wisdom is foolishness and all of our strength is weakness and all of our hearts are full of decay apart from the transforming work of the Spirit of God by the Word of God, that we do not have what it takes to fight this battle all alone. We need strength that we don't have. And we need to find someone who does have it, or we are all doomed. My freshman year of college, I move into a little dorm, and there's uh, four little buildings all together, and all the dorms were on one side of campus except my little weird dorm. It was called The Hill. It was over on this side. And it was all engineering majors and a couple of Bible majors. And that was it. And the engineering majors, a uh, little, little two-story building uh, in the room right above me, found a couch on the side of the road and thought that uh, it was a good idea to get that back into the dorm. And so there's a little brick stairwell, and um, they just twisted and turned and pivoted their way and finally managed these engineering students to get this thing up through the stairwell and around the corner and it took them like half a day and I thought it was never going to happen. Well, the end of the year comes and they have to get this couch out of their dorm room, right? And they get this great idea, hey, that was a lot of work getting it up through the stairwell. I know what we can do. We can lower it over the side of the railing and a couple of us will hold it up top, and a couple of us will be standing there below, and we'll be able to get it, right? Not a big deal. And uh, because they're, you know, engineering majors, uh, physics majors, they're these science-type guys, they figure out that, of course, the hardest part of this whole deal is going to be holding this thing at the top, because that'll be where all the weight is. And so they only send one guy downstairs. His name is Adam. He's built like Barney Fife, Right? <laughs> And so here is Adam, and he's standing at the bottom, and he's, man, he, it's, they're lowering it over the side, and it's two feet away, and he's going, I got it, I got it. It's a foot away, I got it, I got it, I got it. It's six inches away, I got it, I got it, I got it. It's now in his hands, I got it, I got it, I got it, and they let go. You know what Adam says? I don't got it. Ah, and we hear the noise. And the rest of us in the parking lot laughing hysterically because this is great entertainment. This is more, and we're not allowed to have TVs at Little Christian College, so this is the most exciting thing we've seen all week. <sighs> and yet, how many believers are marching into spiritual battle and they have this unearned confidence? I got it, I got it, I got it. You do not got it. It is a gift to teach our children this great truth. You ready? And we do our very best to encourage them and to build them up and to help them to see all of their great and wonderful potential. But to say to all of them, very truthfully, to look them in the eyes and remind them, look, apart from Jesus, you're weak. Apart from Jesus, you are not enough. Apart from Jesus, you do not have what it takes. Apart from Jesus, you are going to fail. Apart from Jesus, you are going to lose the war. Do you understand But there is a God who gives us strength. Be strengthened. I love this great passive plural pronoun, a couple of, or a verb here, a couple of things that we uh, understand. This verb here, to, to be strong, to be strengthened in his might, to be strengthened. It's um, a verb that suggests that it has to happen continually, right? You don't get strengthened one time and then you're good. 
Uh, the other day, we went out and played tennis with the kids, and man, I felt terrible about that. And the next day, I ate a salad. I had a piece of broccoli, right? Boom, done, healthy, right? No, it's not enough to do it once. You have to do it over and over again. <laughs> you go to the gas station. My car is on empty. I fill it all the way full. It costs $55. Thanks, Biden. And now, right, here I am driving the car around. It's filled, right? Done. Forever. <laughs> a week and a half later, I got to fill it up again. I open my Bible, I read it, one time, 15 minutes, got it, sanctified, right? This call to be strengthened is a call to continually be strengthened, day by day, hour by hour, battle by battle, over and over and over again to appeal to the only one who can strengthen me for success in the battle. Now, here's the other interesting factor here. It's in the second person. He's telling all of them, hey, you need to be strengthened. It's plural. We read all of these New Testament passages, and I am as guilty of it as anybody, thinking that he is writing, write to me. Well, everything that Paul is writing here applies to the individual, but he's writing to churches, and this call is a call to, in the plural, you all be strengthened. When we say that we don't have what it takes to win the war apart from Jesus Christ, what we're saying is, as a church, we are too weak. Our church alone is weak. Our church alone is unprepared. Our church alone has no reason to stand in confidence in the battle against all of these satanic forces. But with Jesus, together we might be strengthened. Next week, when we look at each one of the pieces of the armor of God, we'll look at it together as a church. Not just as the individuals, but all of us together. Are we all putting on the helmets and the belts? Are we all standing firm with the sword of the Word of God? Are we all together as a church analyzing what it means to be strong in the Lord? And so you might be asking yourself right now at the very beginning of this whole discussion, is our church strong? Have we been strengthened? Are we prepared? For the battles that are coming our way. Well, there's two ways to be prepared. And here's what we find. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. How can we be strong two ways? We can be strong when we are in the Lord. We can be strong if we are in the Lord. We are strong as long as we are in union with God. You remember we spent the first couple of months in our study of the book of Ephesians talking about what it means to be in union with Christ, in union with the Lord, that we have been drawn into a relationship with Him, that we were dead and now we're alive and we are a part of His body, unalterably bound to Jesus Christ. Our old identity fading away, our new identity blossoming into Jesus Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I having died and having risen again to new life in Jesus Christ, as Paul would say in Galatians chapter 2. We are one with him as a body. He is our head. He informs our hearts. He fills our minds. We are close to him. It's something that is achieved by God, predestined in chapter 1 from before time was written down, and yet it's something in which the believer participates, and we participate through obedience, and that kind of obedience is illustrated throughout this whole book. One New Testament commentator puts it this way, his name is Francis Folks. people cannot strengthen themselves, they must be empowered, and that not once for all, but constantly. Furthermore, he says, not by the Lord, though that would be true enough, but again, in the Lord. We are strong in the Lord. When life is lived in union with Him, within the orbit of His will and so of His grace, there need not be failure due to powerlessness. How do we get strong? First, we get strong by being in union with God. Does He have enough strength to lend us? Think back to our time, the last couple of months in the book of Ephesians. 
Is there any power available? Is there any might potential? Does he have anything that he can share? Can he really help us very much at all? And when you think back to the very early words of the book of Ephesians, you start to think about all the ways that the power of God has been demonstrated and illustrated in this book. There was nothing, and God brought something, and he put it in order. And through that order, he conceived the idea of a people, a people who would fall away in rebellion and sin, but he would draw them back. They were dead, he made them alive. They were enemies, he made them sons and daughters. They were in the futility of the darkness of their minds, and he illuminated them to the great gospel of Jesus Christ and set them over the entirety of the earth by which nothing could stop their message. He helped them to love each other in unconscionable ways, Husbands loving their wives just like Christ himself loved the church. Children responding to obedience to grow up into Christ's likeness. Slaves and masters sitting down at the same table as brothers in Christ. There is power unimaginable in Jesus. Avail yourself, Paul pleads, avail yourself of that power. There is power on every page of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And it is available to those who are in Christ. Are you in Christ? And then secondly, he would ask, have you put on the armor of God? First, him be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. I love that verb, put on. There's an urgency there. A real visceral urgency. My uncle who fought in Vietnam spoke very little of what happened there, but he did uh, bring to me one time the inner liner of his helmet. And uh, the exterior had crumbled away many years earlier, but he still had the hard shell liner of that thing and he gave it to me. And he said, you know, this helmet saved my life. He'd been shot once, and it ricocheted off his helmet. He received a purple heart, but he lived. There was a young man, his battalion, who, a uh, big head of hair, they're marching through the jungle, and he's just sweating. I mean, just buckets of sweat, and they haven't seen any enemy combatants in days. And in an attempt to find any relief from the unrelenting heat, he takes off his helmet. And almost as soon as he takes it off and puts it at his side, from out in the jungle in places that they can't see, the fire starts propelling toward them. And immediately my uncle grabs this young man around the shoulders and throws him to the ground and he says, put it on, put it on, put it on, put it on right now, put it on. Because he knows, he knows that it may be the only thing keeping him from leaving that place alive. The verb that Paul uses here to put on the armor of God is in a word of urgency. It's not precaution for something that might happen. It's not insurance in case possibly something might. It's needed right now. The way that Peter talks about Satan is like a lion who is seeking prey to devour. You're being hunted. He is a predator. And all of those unprepared who have distanced themselves from the strength that comes from being in union with Christ, who have not put on the full armor of God, are his prey. Put it on. Put on the armor of God. Now, put it on. It's life and death. There is possibility to withstand the schemes of the devil. I love what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, for though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. But you got to put it on. Or it's of no use to you. I'm a kid. 
And my friend gets a brand new bike for Christmas. I remember at fifth grade, the coolest bike. And uh, his parents give him the helmet and the guards there for his deal. And we're out and there's a little hill at the college just three blocks down the street from us. He says, hey guys, watch this. And he comes down the hill and he lets go with his hands and he sticks his legs straight out and he catches a root and flies head over rear right out onto the pavement and breaks his arm and a couple of ribs on this side. (laughs) Um, Hey, hit it right there, right there on the elbow. Broke this bone and one of them here too, right? Two of them. We gave you the gear. Did it work? No. Why? I never put it on. There are a lot of believers who are being devoured, eaten alive, torn to shreds. Not because they don't have access to infinite power through a generous God, but because they won't Put it on. Now, <clears throat> what Paul's doing here, uh, go ahead and turn back to Isaiah chapter 59. The whole idea of the armor of God is not new to Ephesians chapter 6. In fact, the idea of the armor of God extends all the way back here to Isaiah chapter 59. And it's armor, not just that God provides, but armor that God himself is wearing. So go ahead and take a look at Isaiah 59, starting verse 14. Justice is turned back, and righteousness stands far away, for truth has stumbled in the public squares, and uprightness cannot enter Truth is lacking, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Well, can we see any modern parallels to this idea that in the public square that truth has absolutely fled its ever-living mind, right? And I tell you what is absolutely baffling to me, and I wrestle with it as a parent myself, but we live in this world that loves to lie to us. In fact, it's one of the great descriptors of Satan himself that he is the liar. He's the one who is devoid of truth. Go ahead and read Uh, John's writings, the Gospel of John, chapters 12, 14, right? Go ahead and read uh, 1 John chapter 5, or read the book of Revelation and see how John describes Satan. He's described as the accuser, and he's described as the one who absolutely loves obliterating the truth. Now, I believe with all my heart that when we come here for Sunday school that we are doing something to war against darkness by inculcating uh, our, our students and our adults here with truth. Right? Indoctrination is used as a bad word. Indoctrination is a great word for believers. We are inculcating ourselves with doctrine. We are indoctrinating ourselves, right? But you're going to come to Sunday school, and you're going to be here for half an hour. That's how long we have it right now, 35 minutes. Then you're going to come in here, and I'm going to preach for 30 or 40 minutes, give or take, right? Something like that. And then we're going to go out into the world, and the world is dark. It is the definitive descriptor of the world in the book of Ephesians. They're dark. Television is dark. It's lying to you. You understand that? And you're online and it's lying to you. And we got these little squares in our pockets and they're all lying to us. For hours and hours and hours a day, parents, you may be equipping your children with little devices that lie to them all day long. And so days' worth of hours have accumulated of lies, and we show up to church on Sunday morning, we hope to be equipped in like 40 minutes to wage war against the darkness. And so in the great vast expanse of the darkness of space, we've lit one match, and we send kids away to college, and we wonder why they walk away so easily from the faith because we equip them so little. We had no urgency in the call to put on the armor of God. In fact, we helped them love the darkness. And any time the light got in the way, we made it take a back seat because we were too busy entertaining ourselves. Or We are strong when we are armored. And we find it is the armor of the Lord here wages 
against the days of truthlessness. Uh, middle of verse 15, the Lord saw it and it displeased him that there was no justice. Verse 16, he saw that there was no man and wondered that uh, there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought him salvation and his righteousness upheld him. And he put on, you see the language here that Paul is borrowing in Ephesians chapter 6? He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak according to their deeds. So he will repay wrath to his adversaries, repayment to his enemies, to the coastlands he will render repayment. So they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rise of the sun, for he will come like a rushing stream, which the wind of the Lord drives, and a redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, declares the Lord. This is a picture of the people of God under assault from the public square of darkness and truthlessness, and because there is no one who will stand up for them like the old judges and wage war in righteousness on behalf of the people. The Lord himself puts on armor and comes down and takes care of business. It's a beautiful illustration of God's willingness to embody amongst his people the same truths that he calls them to. And it's the same thing that Paul alludes to here back in Ephesians chapter 6. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Is this the armor that God wears or the armor that God provides? Maybe a little bit of both, I'm not sure. But we're told that regardless, those who wear the armor of God are able to stand. Not march, not advance, but to stand. That we might hold the fort at all costs. Now, you remember that all this language is plural, right? We're talking about the church. We're not just talking about individuals. We're talking about our congregation right here standing. Can you imagine that? In your mind's eye, can you imagine that out there across the field, newly mowed this week, that there is an enemy prowling back and forth just up on that little hill? And that all of his army stands beside him, ready to dismantle the church of God. That we are surrounded by a great, wrathful, lying, awful horde of those who want nothing for us but dread and death and doom. Church, we have to put on the armor of God. The urgency is real, but the truth is equally true that once it is put on, we will be able to stand. Equipped in the armor of God, there is no force in the cosmos that can stop the people of God from doing what they have been called to do. We will stand. If we will avail ourselves of that which God offers freely to equip us with, there is no one who can take us down. We will hold firm. We will remain. We will stand tall in the might that God gives His people. We will stand tall against the schemes. We will stand tall against the schemer. The word schemes is methodeus. It's only used twice in the New Testament here and in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. We're not warring um, like many would help us perceive this month, right? Um, Hollywood having run out of ideas for horror movies. No more Frankensteins, no more vampires, no more... One of the great uh, wells for them to draw is to think of all sort of devilish things only loosely informed from Scripture and tell us that they're hiding in the attic or in the basement or in the dark corners of unlit rooms. They're not. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about creatures with claws and we're talking about someone who hates you, who hates righteousness, who hates truth, who hates holiness, who hates love. We're talking about rulers. We've seen that term used already here against authorities, 
against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. That's a weird term, cosmocratoris. That is world rulers. One whose authority isn't over the whole world, but all of his authority is drawn from the world. That's the way especially John likes to think about the devil. He's tethered to this world, unredeemed, not yet made new. When God will come and wipe this ball clean with a cleansing fire, so he will erase from it the hideous, maleficent, brutal, dark, evil, wicked strength that Satan has loved for so long. Um, in fact, he'll say in 1 John 5, we know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. He goes on to describe him as we are waging war against the spiritual forces in the of evil in the heavenly places. He's not just down here, he's floating around up there, appealing to God as the great accuser, making his way before the throne, a la Job chapter 1, to accuse the saints. They're not weak, they're not in the armor, they're not united to him. I love that in Revelation chapter 12 when he's cast out of the heavens, no more accusing. The war of God at the hand of Christ and the sword that it extrudes from his mouth has come to cast him out of heaven and then finally to cast him beyond the earth into the fiery pit. How do we respond? I guess that's a great closing question. How do we regard the rulers, the authorities, the cosmocratoris, the world powers, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Two mistakes. Don't underestimate them. Don't underestimate the power and drive of a millennia's old evil adept at wounding the saints and carving away those who are only pretending to faith. When it says that even Michael himself is wary of engaging such a wily foe, we take wisdom from that. But the opposite is also true. We do not underestimate this fiendish schemer, nor do we overestimate him. It's important as believers that we understand that while there are many battles yet to be fought, the war has ultimately already been won. Do you remember this? Um, Growing up there in Ohio, I hardly ever saw any snakes. And um, the neighborhood I grew up in, my house was built in the 19-teens. There hadn't been in a, any woods there for 100 years. And we moved into our house over there on Catch Point, and there's big woods behind our house. And right before we moved in, they had come in and cleared out all the pine trees. And so every critter that had been hiding back there came out. And the first year we were uh, over there in the new house, uh, I saw more snakes in the first six months than I had seen my whole life. I remember the, we killed a bunch of big black snakes and brown snakes, and I know they're not bad for they eat the bad snakes, but if you're up by the house, you're going to get killed. So, I remember the first time I saw a copperhead. I remember as a little boy, my grandfather telling me a story of an uh, old, nearly blind man who lived down by them in the holler who loved to go fishing and one day he went to go fishing by himself and he did and he made his way down to the river bank and he dug his hand into the soil there and he was trying to find worms to put on his hook and instead he found a nest of baby copperheads and they bit him and he died. They found him there on the river bank. One of the things that terrified me to death about snakes, I'm sure, hearing those stories as a little boy. 
The first time I saw a copperhead, the thing I was surprised by, it was early in the spring, they're cold-blooded, hadn't had a chance to warm up, it's pretty slow, little thing. Now it's deadly, right? I'm not going to pick it up. <laughs> it's not a pet, it's not a toy. But I had a shovel, and I remember feeling all the wisdom of, don't play with it, right? But I feel in control of the situation. I swung the shovel back and landed on its head, and the front third of that thing just disappeared instantaneously. Don't underestimate it. Don't overestimate it either. That's why C.S. Lewis used to call the devil smutty face. He's a defeated foe. When Jesus Christ rose and they saw the empty grave, the devil knew that for all time there was awaiting for him a final destiny that Christ, having completed his work, may put his feet up on the back of those who had opposed him. And now we come to what we haven't done in quite a while. We have in front of us the elements that remind us of this very victory. I'm going to give you just a moment and I want you in that moment to think about what it is that we've talked about. What Paul has illuminated so clearly and passionately in Ephesians chapter 6. We don't live in fear. We don't live in fear of the evil one. We're sober, we're wise, but we're not afraid. We're unperturbed. We're alert, we're ready. We have the armor on, but we're not scared because we know who we are in Christ and we know who the devil is defeated by Christ and we know who Jesus is risen from the dead, unconquerable. And we know that here in the blood of Christ we stand and we'll stand until he comes again and there is nothing that can knock us down if we are in Christ. So we have these elements. We're going to take just a quiet moment together to get our hearts and minds ready for this. I'm going to bring us together in prayer. And then after that, I'll give you a moment. You can come up and when you're ready, and grab the element, take it back to your seat. We'll take it all together. Let's just spend a moment in quiet prayer. O oh, great God, unparalleled in power, thank you for saving us, for making us yours, for redeeming us from this dark and evil age and branding us anew as children of light. Help us to approach this table soberly and joyfully and hopefully in a hope triumphant. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, when you're ready, you can come up here. You can grab the elements and take them back to your seat. We'll give you just a moment to do that.
When everyone has done so, we'll take the elements at the same time.